Well, I believe that God's got something powerful for us today, y'all. I believe that the Lord is wanting to speak to us. I believe that God hasn't stopped speaking. As a matter of fact, he's actually increased what he's saying to us in this season. We've just got to be able to tune our ears in the right frequency so we can hear what he is saying, so we can hear what he is declaring to our lives. Because in moments like this, rather than reacting, we need to be listening. We need to, be ha we need to have our listening ears so we can hear what the Spirit of God wants to pour into us in a season like this. If we're able to open up our spiritual ears to hear what God is saying, where there's a way that we can isolate our soul, our emotions from what the Spirit of God is pouring into us so that we don't get into a panic and we don't go crazy and we don't go insane. The Word of God says that He will give peace to those who have their minds set on Him. And so right now we're setting our minds on Jesus and we're excited about what the Lord is doing in this season. Amen, 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 amen. Uh, we're going to get into the Word of God. I want you to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. And today I'm reading out of the NLT version. This morning I'm reading out of the NLT version. Isaiah chapter 40, actually verse 29. We're going to be starting from verse 29, the NLT version. And uh, we're going to take off from there. We're going to jump actually to Acts chapter 1, verse 12 through uh Verse 14, and today we're going to continue with this series, God's ultimate yes, God's ultimate yes, God's ultimate yes. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 29 says like this, and he gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion, but those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. Come on now. I believe that somebody's finding new strength even right now. Strength that you didn't even thought you had because it didn't come from you. It came from the Spirit of God as you decided to trust in the Lord. And it says here, they will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Man, that's a good word. Man, that's, that, that's so encouraging this morning that if we just trust in him, he will strengthen us. Acts chapter 1 verse 12 through 14 reads like this. It says, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room. They went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon, the zealot and Judas, the son of James. These guys were over the limit right there. If they were in quarantine, they were way over the limit. And it says like this, verse 14, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer with the woman and Mary, with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. I'm going to leave it there for now. Father, we thank you for your word. We know it's alive and well. We just ask, Lord God, this morning that your spirit speak to us like only you know how, Lord. Lead us, Lord God, as we hear your voice. Lead us, Father God, as we're trying, Lord God, to have clarity in this season, Father. We believe, Lord God, that you will cause us to arise like never before. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. The waiting room. That's what I want to talk to you guys about today. I want to talk to you about the waiting room. The waiting room. Yes, I want to talk to you guys about the waiting room. Can somebody comment that right now? The waiting room. Anybody ever have some experiences in the waiting room? In the waiting room? Um, growing up, I don't know if this is a Hispanic thing. I don't know if this is, a, a, you know, growing up in the hood thing. But we spent a 
a major part of our childhood in the waiting room. Because always, it seemed like always one of us was either cutting our hands, uh, breaking bones. I mean, we would be in the waiting room all the time for random stuff. And the waiting room is a place that most of us don't want to be. Most of us don't want to be in a waiting room. In the waiting room, there are people with a range of situations. Some might have broken bones. Some might have some lacerations. Some might have uh, situations that cause them unrest to the point where they can't sleep, where they have insomnia, where they have all types of depression. There's all types of stuff going on in the waiting room. There's all types of uncertainty in the waiting room. But one thing that everyone in the waiting room has in common is that everyone in the waiting room is in transition. I want someone to comment that right now. I'm in transition. I'm in transition. When we're in a season of transition, there's a certain amount of uncertainty. There's a a sort of place that we are in transition that makes us feel out of control, that we are no longer in control because we are leaving something that is known towards something that is unknown, but we haven't gotten there yet. We haven't gotten there. And that's where the disciples found themselves, is that they had left from a season of having Jesus do everything with them and having Jesus continue to be there when they messed up and fix it up. But now Jesus is no longer there to fix up their mess ups. And yes, Jesus has appeared. Yes, Jesus has shown himself as the resurrected one. He has shown himself as the one who is now alive alive and they are amazed by that but now they don't have Jesus there with them to be able to fix some of their mess ups you know like the time that you know Jesus said let's cross over to the other side after he had done a great miracle and Jesus was expecting for them to be able to operate in the same authority that he did. And so when they were going to the other side on the water, all of a sudden a storm began to stir up. And when that storm stirred up, they freaked out and they did what they knew how to do. They went to Jesus and they asked Jesus, don't you think, you know, can't you see we're about to drown Jesus? Can't you see that? And Jesus wakes up frustrated because Jesus expects them that by now they should know this. They should know that he's given them the authority to cast out devils, the authority to tell the wind you need to shut down in the name that is above all names, in the name of Jesus. And I believe right now Jesus is waiting on us to tell that virus you've got to go. You've got no right to come into my house in the name of Jesus fear you've got to go depression you've got to go in the name of Jesus but we're in the waiting room because when we're in the waiting room and when we're in the waiting room it's a place of unknown it's a place of uncertainty it's a place where most of us don't want to be but all of us find ourselves in the waiting room, in the waiting room. And so this upper room where they went to to gather for prayer and they went to to be able to devote themselves to God, that, that place, the upper room where they went to wait on the day where the Holy Spirit would descend, the upper room became their waiting room. The upper room became the waiting room. See, because I didn't read a couple verses before. A couple verses before, Jesus is getting ready to leave. And Jesus tells the disciples, listen, I want you to go to Jerusalem, your home base, your home. And I want you to quarantine there until the Holy Spirit descends. I want you to stay there until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then you're going to have authority. And then you're going to have power. And so he says, I want you to... Go back home, go back to Jerusalem, and wait until the Holy Spirit arrives. So the upper room becomes 
their waiting room. You know, I looked up the word wait here in the original Greek text, and one of the phrases that best defines this word that Jesus uses, it says like this, it describes the word wait, and it's kind of like freaked me out when I read this at first. It says, all the bases are covered. All the bases are covered. Which means that if we want to cover in order to be able to score, we've got to go from first to second to third to home. It's not enough for you to just get to first base. It's not enough for you to get to second base. If you want to score, you got to go first, second, third, and touch home plate. That's the only way that you get to score and you get to win. You've got to be able to cover all of your bases. But what happens is sometimes we get desperate and we we, we do not end up covering all the bases. Why? Because we go before the coach sends us the signs. See, a lot of baseball, all baseball players, most of them, they have signs that they need to follow by their, their base coach or their running coach. And that coach tells them when they can go to the next base. But sometimes the player gets desperate and they might not see, they might not see something that the coach is seeing. And so they get desperate and they actually try to steal that base without receiving the sign and so in this season we've got to make sure that we cover all of our bases and to do that it means that we got to wait for the signs somebody comment that right now follow the signs follow the signs the holy spirit is giving us signs right now even in this season but we've got to learn to wait Somebody say, I got to learn to wait. I got to learn to wait on God's time. I got to learn to wait on God's miracle. I got to learn to wait rather than run. Oh, that's so good. I got to learn to wait rather than run. I got to stop running from my pain. I got to stop running from my depression. I got to stop running from my past hurts. And I have to wait on the sign that Jesus is giving me through his spirit, through his spirit. And what ends up happening is that sometimes we get too desperate. We try to go to second base when it's not time. And then we get caught off guard. And all of a sudden we get, we get caught on a double play. But Jesus said to his disciples, go to, the, go to Jerusalem and wait till I send you the Holy Spirit. Till I send you the Holy Spirit. In this season, the Lord is giving us signs. And it's not just the signs that we're in the end times. If somebody can help me out with some water. It's not just the time of end times. It's not just those signs. Those are pretty obvious signs. Anyone who's not even picked up a Bible knows that is the end times. It knows that, that the signs are here that are unfolding, manifesting, and pointing towards the coming of the Lord. And even if they might be atheists, they know that something is about to happen. And what, what's going on around us is a sign of greater things. Yes, this is the moment that is unfolding, showing us the end times, but it's also unfolding to show us that there's a great outpouring that the Lord wants to give us right now in this season. And so this is why we need the Spirit of God for this season. We need the Spirit of God to break out in this season. There's a sign going on that God wants to do something on the earth. That he's about to shift things in the church. As a matter of fact, he's shifting things on the church. When we come back, we're not doing church as normal. We're not just doing a regular program and then everybody go have some brunch at Denny's. We're going to cause a move of God that's going to go beyond this building. As a matter of fact, I believe that we've been moved out of this building. We've been displaced out of this building in part because the Lord has been warning us. To be able to preach his word out of the four walls. In other words, to live out what we say we believe in. So it was hard for these disciples to wait because pre-Jesus, most of them didn't have any hope. Most of them didn't have the expectation for miracles to happen. And Jesus was at the center of this whole movement. And yeah, he promised he would send the Holy Spirit, 
but we're not sure exactly how this is going to work. We're not sure exactly how this is going to work. Yes, we know he's alive. And we are amazed by how we are, we, we've seen him be raised from at the third day, but we're not sure how this is going to work. And it's hard to wait when you're not sure how's it going to look like. And I hear some of you guys saying the same thing. I'm trusting in God, but how is he going to do this? How is he's going to, he, is he going to call us to be able to break out of this pandemic? It's hard to wait, to wait, to wait, to wait, to wait when you don't know what's going to happen to your loved ones. It's hard to wait and wait and wait when you don't know what's going to happen with your finances, when you don't know what's ahead for your job or your business. It's hard to wait when you're not sure if you will ever get to experience breakthrough. It's hard to wait. Somebody say that right now. It's not easy. It's hard. It's hard. Um, and, and the Lord never said that it was going to be hard. He said in this world, you will have to deal with trouble. You will face trouble. You will face affliction. But take heart. In other words, take courage for I am with you. I am with you. And this is why I'm not just seeing, I'm not waiting to see what might happen. Some of us are waiting just to see what might happen. When we wait just to see what might happen, we sit back as spectators with our hands crossed. Let me see if you're really God. Because if you're really God, like, you're going to get rid of this thing. If you're really God, like, you're going to stop this pandemic. If you're really God, you're, you're going to cause a vaccine to be produced immediately. If you're really God, if you're really God, if you're really God, we got our hands crossed. That's not waiting, y'all. That's not waiting. That, that, that's what you call just seeing what might happen. I'm not just sitting around seeing what might happen. I'm waiting to see God make it happen. I'm waiting to see God do what he always does. It might not be on my time. It might not be on your time. But I'm waiting to see God do what only he can do. What only he can do. There's a big difference between the two. The first one says, I might or might not see God do something or anything or nothing. The second says, I'm in expectation to see God make it happen. Come on, somebody better comment that right now. I'm waiting to see God because I'm in expectation. I'm waiting to see God because I'm in expectation of what God is going to do. I'm waiting to see the goodness of God unfold. I'm waiting to see the faithfulness of God unfold. I'm, I'm waiting to see the supernatural power of God begin to unfold. Somebody say, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. You guys ready to do this? You guys ready to do this? Okay, so if we're going to do this, we got to go back to Isaiah 4, 40, 31. If we're going to do this, we got to go back. And I just want to read the first part real quick. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. Because the first thing we need to do in order to do this, in order to wait on God, in order to... to to have the, the courage in order to be able to actually cover all of our bases, the first thing we need to do is find new strength. Find new strength. In other words, the strength doesn't come from me. It comes from a greater source. It doesn't come from my intellect. It comes from a greater source. It doesn't come from my wisdom. It comes from a greater source. It doesn't come from my money. It comes from a greater source. It doesn't come from my power. It comes from a greater source. So we're going to find new strength. And in order to get this, in order to be able to, to get this, we need to find new strength. And our strength is recovered. Check this out. For those of you who have lost strength and you're at wit's end with that third grader who you're trying to show how to do division one way, but the teacher said, no, she taught me how to do it like this. And you're like, listen, you're gonna, this is how you're going to learn. Those of you trying to find your strength, dealing with your spouse at home, 
12 hours a day. I want to help you out this morning. Somebody ready? All right. And our strength is recovered by trusting in the Lord. Our strength is recovered not by trusting on the daily briefings from CNN and Fox, but on trusting in the Lord. This morning, the Spirit of God is asking you, where is your trust? Where is your trust? Check, check out the second part of this verse. It says, they will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Man, I'm, I, I want to work with this first part of the verse right here. Soaring high on wings like eagles. Everybody loves this verse. If you've been in this church, if you've been in any church, for, as a matter of fact, you've heard this verse many a times. It's a very encouraging verse, y'all. It's a very encouraging verse. Soaring high on wings like eagles. Man, we love that verse. But here's the thing that we have to do. We have to learn how eagles soar. What makes them soar? See, there's a difference between flying and soaring. There's a difference between flying and soaring. When the eagle flies, it flaps its wings. In other words, it uses its own strength. When it soars, it doesn't use its strength anymore. When it soars, it actually uses the winds. It actually uses the winds to be able to cause it to go up higher in places, in territories, in the air, in the atmosphere, which they cannot go with their own strength. Oh man, I'm preaching to somebody right now. You've gotten this far based on your own strength. As a matter of fact, you've almost wasted your strength because you haven't used the winds of this present moment. See, the eagle, if you know something about the eagle, is that the eagle loves the storm. I know a lot of y'all dropped out right there. Who likes a storm? Who likes a good storm? I, I don't know about you, but I'll be honest with you this morning. I'm not crazy about the storm. But here's the thing. We cannot avoid the storm sometimes. Sometimes the storm is unavoidable. Somebody better declare that the storm is unavoidable. So what do I do with a storm I can't avoid? What do I do with the storm what I, that I can't avoid? I use it to my advantage. I use it to my advantage. Earlier this week, I was a little bit frustrated about having to be in isolation and having to be quarantined. I'm a person that is not a cubicle person. I like to be out and about. But because of this whole quarantine and, um, being, and trying to help and be a part of the, those who stay at home and try to be able to bring the flatten this curve down. I've forced myself to be at home. But I was thinking about the time that I was at home. Was I just doing time? Was I just waiting for a calendar day? Was I just, was I just waiting for May 8th or May 15th when they finally open up the economy and they finally say, yeah, you can go out to the parks and you can go do this and you can go do that? Or was I going to take advantage of the time, right? There's a difference between doing time and taking advantage of it. And some of us right now are isolated in our homes just doing time, just letting time pass us by, just hoping, just marking the X's like we were prisoners, just marking the X day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, and just marking the X. And rather than doing time, I think that we need to take advantage advantage of the time. We need to take advantage of this time to bring forth reconciliation in our family. We need to take advantage of this time to self-reflect, correct certain areas in our lives. We need to take advantage of the time because here's what eagles do. The first thing that they do is that they prepare. They prepare. It uses its own strength to fly, but it causes, but it uses the storm to actually soar. In other words, what others see as in opposition, the eagle uses to its advantage. Will you continue to see your storm as your opposition or will you use it to your advantage so that rather than flying on your own strength, you begin to soar because you're using the force 
of the storm to go even higher than what you ever thought you could. I'm speaking to some creatives now. I'm speaking to people who are writers and people who have the potential to write songs and people who have the potential to write screenplays and people who have the potential to write books and people who have the potential to draw art. People who have a tremendous talent but you've hidden it in this season because you're just doing time rather than taking advantage of it. I'm speaking to entrepreneurs right now who are just doing time but God has given you a tremendous idea to be able to unfold in your life. I'm speaking to ministry people, people who are serving as, as, as kingdom people who are beginning to un allow the spirit of God to begin to unfold new creative ways to be able to advance his kingdom. We're not doing time, guys. We're taking advantage of it. So as I was thinking and contemplating on preparation, I remembered what happens at the waiting room. Before you go into the operating room, before the doctor even sees you, they actually prepare you. They actually prepare the patient. And the way they prepare the patient is by taking down your information. They'll take down your past medical history. They'll take down your present condition. And they'll take down the level of pain if you're feeling some sort of pain. All of this information actually prepares the patient prior to being seen. All of this information prepares the patient prior to being seen. So what if our waiting room, listen to this guys, what if our waiting room was actually our preparation room? What if this season was actually a season of preparation? Let's get that on top over there. What if this season is a season of preparation. What if we went from waiting to preparation? From waiting to preparation. Our waiting room, for many of us right now, is about to become our preparation room. Because we're going to open our eyes to the new reality that the storm is not just the opposition, but it's something that we can take advantage. So rather than flying, we begin to soar. God wants to cause us to soar in this season, which means that we've got to use the storm we're facing now, this season of isolation, this season of quarantine, this season of dealing with fear and having to face depression and having to face uncertainty. We're going to actually use it to our advantage so we just don't fly. We just don't use our own strength. We actually get to soar, which means that we're, you were, we're using the strength from somewhere else. This is not time to simply sit around and lick our wounds or, and count our losses. I'm going to use this season to cover all of my bases. This season, the enemy is not going to cause me to end up stranded on first or end up stranded on second. I'm coming home on this one. This storm, I'm going to cover all of my bases. In this storm, I'm not going to get stranded on third base. I'm going to reach home. Somebody comment that right now. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. I'm coming all the way home. I'm going all the way to Jerusalem to wait for the Spirit of God to descend. I believe that God wants to descend and pour His Spirit on the earth like never before but before he does that we've got to be prepared we've got to be prepared what if God is trying to actually prepare us for the greatest outpouring the earth has ever seen? He says, yes, in the last days, it says that, that, that things will seem grim. But at the same time, he also says that, and I will pour my spirit on all flesh, on sons and daughters and elders and men and women and maidservants. In other words, there's not going to be any limit to socioeconomic backgrounds where he wants to pour his spirit is upon all flesh all flesh 
says that they were waiting. And they weren't just waiting. They weren't just sitting around just talking about, all right, let me see what you're going to do now because you told us to go back to Jerusalem. And, you know, we've been here for a while. And Mary's like this. I haven't done my nails for a minute, you know. And they're looking kind of crazy right now. So I need to go to my hair salon and I need to see my stylist right now uh, because, you know, this is looking ugly right now. They weren't just waiting like that. They were waiting, expecting. They they were waiting and doing. They were praying. The Bible says that they devoted themselves to prayer. And it also says that they were in one accord, in one accord. If you go to chapter 2, it says that when the Spirit of God came down, it says that they were all in one accord. But check this out. Not only does it say that they were all in one accord, it says that there were people there from all types of backgrounds, that there were Arabs there, that there were people from different parts of the world. They were gathered in one place. Remember, y'all, the Jews did not associate with other people. As a matter of fact, they didn't get along with other kinds. But in this instance, they had all gathered to wait. They had all gathered to cover their basis. And they were all in one accord. They were all of one mind, a version says, which tells me that before the Spirit of God came down and before they were all in one accord, there must have been some healing that needed to happen. There must have been some reconciliation between the other different types of ethnicities and the people from different nationalities and different types of color backgrounds. There was some healing. There was some reconciliation going on before the Spirit of God came down. This is an opportunity right now in the waiting room, oh, excuse me, in the preparation room that God is giving us to reconcile broken relationships, to reconcile sons and daughters back to the fathers and mothers, to reconcile cousins and aunts and uh, friends who haven't spoken to each other in a long time this is a season for us to get in one accord to get in agreement in one spirit so that once we are prepared somebody say preparation now we're ready now we're ready for the spirit of God to be poured out like never before. I believe that before this thing is over, there are marriages that will be restored. There are relationships between cousins and aunts that will once again be reunited because we got in one accord. Because we used the waiting room and flipped it and turned it into a preparation room. We're about to flip the waiting room and we're going to turn it into a preparation room. They were all gathered in one place. They were able to gather in one place because now they were reconciled to one another. You can be reconciled to God but not reconciled to the people around you. And some of us, even believers in the church, we walk around reconciled to God, but not reconciled to one another. And until you don't have that, you don't have the full experience of the cross. See, the cross is vertical, goes from up down from God to us. We reconcile between us and God. It's vertical, but it's also horizontal. In other words, first I need to reconcile with God, but secondly, I need to reconcile with my brother. I need to reconcile with my sister. I need to reconcile with my auntie. I need to reconcile with my tia. I need to reconcile with my tío. I need to bring forth reconciliation, not just from vertically from up to down, but I also need to reconcile horizontally only then can the spirit of God pour out on us and I'm telling you right now you don't have to be Bapticostal Pentecostal charismatic or automatic to know that you need the spirit of God in your life if the disciples here in Acts chapter 1 waited in Jerusalem just for the Spirit of God to be able to ignite the fire of Pentecost, that means that every single one of us as believers have to wait for the Spirit of God to once again descend in our lives. And maybe we need to wait for Him to descend again because maybe to a certain degree He has left our church experience because we've been focused on everything else but the Spirit of of God the Spirit of God and I know we're not gathered physically in one place 
But it says that they were gathered in one place, in one mind, in one accord. They were all in agreement. Can we get in agreement, in agreement, in agreement that we need to reconcile with God and reconcile with one another? We need to get in agreement. Um, and I know we might not be gathering physically, but what if the non-physical gathering is actually a preparation for a massive gathering? The non-physical gathering is actually preparing us for a gathering that is both physical and spiritual. That it will not just be something that people see because of the numbers that we have in the church, but it will be something that people see because the goodness of God will begin to overflow in our lives. It will begin to overflow in our lives. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up as we get ready to close out. One type of gathering, a type of gathering that would leave people who are connecting with us online now. We haven't even met them. There's people right now watching online connecting with us online, even connecting with us virtually during the week. We haven't even met them yet in the physical, but we're already connected in the spirit. So that means that by the time we get here, we've already been in the same accord, in the same spirit, because we've turned our waiting room into a preparation room, because we've learned not just to fly, in other words, to do stuff on our own strength, but we've learned to use the storm to fly way above the storm and way above the clouds and to use the storm to our advantage. To use the storm to our advantage. Give me some background music, Jarrell. One that would leave us astounded when we got to meet the people who are connecting with God. When we finally get here, we'll, we'll be like, hold on a second. Where'd you come from? And where'd she come from? Where'd this person come from? And I can't even sit in the same seat I used to sit before because there's like a whole family sitting there now and I've never even met them. And it's because they've gathered, not just physically, but they've gathered in the spirit, in the spirit, in the spirit. God's ultimate yes, y'all was sending his son for ransom, but the story doesn't end there. His yes doesn't end with salvation. Because if it ended with just salvation, we would just be happy of the things to come on the other side of this life. But the yes, or the yes, is a continued yes. Is a continued yes. It's a continued promise. So he says, I'm leaving, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to give you my spirit to guide you. I'm going to give you my spirit to lead you. I'm going to give you my spirit to cause you to overcome the trouble that you face. I'm going to give you my spirit to strengthen you in this season.